I'm actually really happy to be able to present here today, so I'm, I'm really excited about talking about, uh, about some of the work that I've been doing over the last few years and how it fits into societal perspectives of risk um, and also into the whole overall theme of volcanoes and society. I'm going to talk about some work I've been doing for the Merapi, following the Merapi 2010 eruption, but more specifically about the importance of collecting impact data. So one of the most important things I think that we can do as scientists and one of the things that the public are keen for is to actually forecast what future eruptions, what those consequences might be for a population uh, in terms of health, in terms of infrastructure damage and uh, what those probabilities are. And the best way of forecasting future impacts is to look at impacts that have happened in the past. So collecting empirical impact data is incredibly important, I think. Um, for the talk, I'm going to quickly summarize why I think it's so important that we collect this data following eruptions, um, and then talk about the Merapi 2010 eruption. That was about 18 months ago, and it's this, uh, this beautiful photo here. And this was taken in the middle of the eruption. It's about 5K from the vent. Um, and then I'll talk about the impact assessment that we carried out. I've got a small cog in this impact assessment. It's, it's um, in collaboration with a number of other scientists, including European scientists, local scientists in, uh, in Merapi, which is in central Java in Indonesia, and also the local village chiefs and the local population. It's very much this impact assessment couldn't have been done without their help. And so I speak on behalf of all of them. Um, and then I really want to focus about on, on one aspect or one source of the empirical impact data, and that's media images. And that, I think, is something new and something we're going to have to deal with in future impact assessments. Um, and then I'll raise a couple of discussion points, of the thousands I, I could do, surrounding this, uh, this issue. So I think this photo and the Bristol contingent, I know I've seen this last week and perhaps the week before, um, it's one of my favorite photos. I can't go past it for the front slide of a presentation because it really encapsulates everything we're trying to do in volcanology, but in also in, in specifically in hazard and risk research. It's trying to prevent disasters, catastrophes like this happening. We don't want the damage to this building to happen. Certainly the owner doesn't. And we don't want the risk to life to be there. So it's trying to reduce that uh, risk. OK. Um, this is a, a photo of the Merapi 2010 eruption taken after the paroxysmal phase. Uh, this area here is about eight kilometers from the vent, and it's actually a photo from Golf Digest, which is a, a lovely range of photos about how horrific the impact was on their golf course. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the in interesting thing is here we have a large swathe about eight kilometers from the vent by about three to four across, uh, where there was complete destruction. All the vegetation has been uh, killed and, and all of the buildings have been removed. But also you have a flow traveling down here off to the right of the image. It goes to about 15 kilometers from the vent, which is quite a long way. Um, so I'll come back to that in a minute when I talk about the Merapi eruption. But the reason we felt it was really important to go out following this eruption and collect data was because volcanic eruptions are relatively rare, especially large explosive volcanic eruptions. A large explosive volcanic eruption in a populated area where you might be able to see impacts on a population are even rarer. So we have very few opportunities to, um, to look at the damage. And also in, in some areas, especially in, in Indonesia, the local scientists are very, very busy. Obviously, you have an eruption crisis on your hands. You're trying to deal with how to evacuate, um, how to um, for, uh, uh, plan for land use in the future. And many times, um, collecting impact data falls by the wayside. And so if we can create a kind of catalog of what happened during the event, what the impacts were in collaboration with local scientists, then as foreign scientists, we, we can provide extra data for them. And I do stress this must be carried out with local scientists and with their blessing. Um, also, this kind of data, as well as being one of the most important sources for forecasting, it tells us about the physical process that happened. Nobody stands in the middle of a pyroclastic density current, which is a fast-moving current of hot ash and gas and rocks, and survives to tell the story. So we don't really have data about what happens within these, these flows and surges. The only way we can try to infer that is from the geology, from photos, and also from the damage data. So 
So it's really important from that perspective. Um, that data can then reduce uncertainty when we, in, we try to establish some relationship between the process that happens and the impact that happens. So we use that in forecasting future impacts. Um, and even though this was one volcano in Indonesia with a certain population, a certain type of building around it, there are implications that we can carry across to other at-risk areas. So we're learning for other volcanoes, not just for Merapi. And so it was really important that we went out there. Um, we kind of termed it forensic volcanology because we went out to look at the damage and the deposits and the hospital records to try to backtrack to what actually happened and therefore what might happen in future eruptions. So this is the Merapi 2010 eruption for people who aren't aware or overly familiar with the eruption, I'll just give a quick, quick background to it. It occurred, started on the 26th of October. It was a rapidly escalating crisis over about 11 days, with the paroxysm occurring on the 5th of November at around midnight. And that's when the majority of the casualties occurred. This background image you might not see too well, but it's an infrared spot image. And the red areas are healthy vegetation, and these gray areas are dead vegetation. So this is a view taken on the 15th of November, 10 days after the paroxysmal effect, uh, impact. rather, And you have a large swathe across the upper flanks of the volcano, about 3, 4K across, 8K distant, and also this long flow. And we saw the majority of the damage here, but we saw the majority of the casualties here. And that's to do with how well the evacuation procedure was carried out. Um, there were 400 official deaths but actually a good 200 of those were from indirect consequences. So, for example, um, motorbike accidents, heart failure, a couple of suicides in the shelters as well. And 200 were from direct contact with these pyroclastic density currents, so with hot material. Uh, most of the casualties were at distance, I've already said that, but more than one million people were displaced during this eruption, which is huge. And that's because it's such a densely populated volcano. And this is not the only volcano like this. We have analogues around the world, so it is important to understand this. Um, another important point is that usually this, erupt the, this volcano produces relatively small eruptions every four or five years. They come to about four to five kilometers from the vent. We have flows to kind of this distance. People are quite familiar with that. They're quite comfortable with that. They know when to evacuate, uh, particularly there's... Uh, someone called Mbaba Marajan, who's thought to be the spiritual gatekeeper of the volcano. He lived about four and a half k from the volcano here, and people followed him as a source of advice on what to do in an eruption, and I'll come back to that. Um, but this 2010 eruption marked a much different, uh, a very different style of eruption. It was very explosive. We had much longer flows, and it impacted a much greater number of people. So a thought as we move forward is, is that marking a prolonged change in style or is it a one-off? And we don't know the answer to that yet. So this graph down here just shows the progression through the eruption. These are the months, September, October, November, December. And this is the alert level going from zero to four. Four is eruption in progress. One is slightly off background level. And this line here is the increase in the exclusion zone to the south, so in this direction, from 5 through to 20 kilometers. And um, we can see it stepped up, not necessarily in line with the, uh, with the alert level. So let me quickly go through the eruption. The very first uh, eruption happened on the 26th of October. This, is this marks this line here. So just after the exclusion zone had been extended 10 kilometers here, from 5 kilometers about here. Um, and just after we've moved into alert level four. This is Kinaraggio, which is the home of the spiritual gatekeeper. And these are some images that appeared in the media within hours of the eruption on the 26th of October. Uh, we can see this is uh, the mosque where Mabar Marajan prayed, and this is his home here. And this is some of the damage that we could identify and the casualties in this area. This was really useful for us because we obviously couldn't enter the area at this time because it was an ongoing eruption, and therefore the risk was too high. But we could see what damage had taken place, place even, and, uh, and what damage we, or what the casualty types were and what their severity was. And there was no other way of getting that data because you could not enter the area. 
And also on the 5th of November, after the rapidly escalating eruption, we had a paroxysmal event which completely obliterated the village here. So we had no record of the damage in that first eruption. So this is the event here, again, just after or around the same time as um, the exclusion zone was extended from 15 kilometers, which is actually about here, to 20K, which is off the bottom here. Um, Jogjakarta is a city of about half a million people, and it sits about 30 kilometers to the south of the volcano. So at 20 kilometers, you're getting into the suburban um, area of, of Jogja. These are some images that I took from our first field mission, which is about three weeks after this, uh, this phase on 5th of November. You might not be able to see these too well, but this is taken in Kinarejo, the same location, and there is complete destruction. You, you, this is standing near the mosque, looking south, and you can't see any buildings or any vegetation pretty much for as far as the eye can see, and that was a densely populated, densely vegetated area. This is a, a truck that's been moved from its original position. We can see that from media images, but also has a massive chunk of house sitting on top of it. <coughs> so it's a very dynamic, very high pressure um, eruption which caused complete devastation. And this is taken six months or about eight months actually after the eruption when we went back for our second field mission. This is the mosque they've rebuilt. This is the area of Mabar Marajan's house and people are instantly back in the area rebuilding. So there's some issues to consider about whether that should have been prevented or how we might land use plan in the future. Just to skip down from the same event, 5th of November, around midnight, we have this large explosive blast that caused complete devastation on the upper flanks, but we have a long flow that reached about 15 and a half K. And we did a lot of study in Brongang village, which is around 13 and a half kilometers from the volcano, technically just inside the exclusion zone but they were also just on the periphery of where the exclusion zone moved five kilometers, and that was around the time of the eruption. It's difficult to put a time constraint on it, but it happens that um, most people in this village were in the process of evacuating as the eruption struck, which is perhaps one of the worst situations because a lot of people are outside on the streets and uh, gathering their belongings. These are pictures I took on the field mission. This is standing on the river, on the river bank, looking down into the village. The village is on the side of the river. There's a Sabo Dam, which is a, an engineered structure that tries to retain material from Lahars. And in this case, there's a possibility it actually helped to promote the detachment of a surge, so a, a low particles of concentration uh, part of a current into this village. And the, the deposits here are, are centimeters. Uh, looking at the buildings, if you can see them, there's hardly any damage to them. But in this area, out of 59 people present in the village, 54 of them died, and the, the other five have severe burns. So there was near total lethality. Those are some of the images, again, in the media of the rescue, which happened about 2.30 in the morning on the 5th of November. So this is just summarizing what I think were some of the main points uh, and that we had within this impact assessment and maybe why it was a step above previous impact assessments. Um, and it's not just because of our work, there's actually something to do with the crisis itself. So it was rapidly escalating and then rapidly declining, which meant that we could enter safely, and that's really important. We could enter with the blessing of the local scientists that, that there wasn't a too high volcanic risk to us, but also that the impact environment was pristine at that time. If you leave too big a gap, you're going to have rains that would remove geological deposits. You're going to have potentially rebuilding or clean up by human activity. But we could tell from looking at the media images and, and being in the field that we had a pristine impact environment. Um, our assessment was very much multidisciplinary. We worked across geology, damage, and casualties, and also agriculture as well, and health, ongoing health. Um, and we used a number of different data sources, and some of these are quite new in impact assessment and will become very important, I think, so especially remote sensing. So satellite images, but also media images, and that's what I want to talk a little bit more about. Um, and it's a longitudinal study. We continue to go back to see how the disaster recovery is, uh, is improving with time or is carrying on with time. This is our field mission here. And again, just to say that we were invited by... The, the Indonesian government, we collaborated fully with local scientists and the population, and I don't think these impact assessments could or should be carried out without 
the approval from the local, uh, the local scientists. Okay, so just to talk a little bit more about how we used media images in our impact assessment and how important they were, these are shots taken before the eruption. This is, again, the mosque for Mabal Marajan, for the spiritual gatekeeper. This is his house. This is a media image, the one I showed earlier, taken on the 27th of October, so when they were going in to look for survivors from the 26th October eruption. You can see there's, um, we could deduce from this, there was relatively low dynamic pressures. Buildings are still standing. There's a couple of roof tiles flipped off. Slim trees are still standing. And, and this building has suffered damage, but the one next to it hasn't. So by looking at the building type, we could make some estimations of what dynamic pressures there were. Also, we can see that there's no fire. There's no charring to any of these uh, building components or trees, so it was relatively low temperature surge. Um, and without that media image, when we went in December 2010, we wouldn't have had a clue, basically. So here, this is the impact that came from the 5th of November, the paroxysmal event, and there is no record of these structures. We walked straight past them and about two kilometers further up the volcano before we worked out that actually they'd been completely destroyed, and that's why we couldn't see them. So these were really, really invaluable, and they were available in huge quantities um, on the internet very quickly. OK, this is another example of how we use the media images. This is a beautiful shot taken around the 1st of November, so in between the start of the eruption but before the final event. And this is taken from the west, looking due east, and most of the impact went to the south here. So we can see that there's a pyroclastic flow moving down towards the south flanks, but then we have this lift-off plume in this location. And we can associate that with a very high ridge that is a topographic um, obstacle for these flows coming down the south flank. And that was very important for the blast that later happened on the 5th of November, um, trying to model what the impacts were because of the topographic uh, obstacles. It was, it was very much this ridge stopped this, the blast reaching a number of houses on the other side. And this helped us to identify that it was doing that. OK, um, this is Brongang Village. So this is about 13 kilometers to the south of the volcano. This is where I said there was a, a large number of people killed. Um, and also where we had a large number of media images. So a lot of people went in with the rescuers and took photos of fatalities, of casualties, and of the damage. And they were really, really useful for us in trying to, trying to derive what happened at the time of the eruption. Um, but I think there's questions about whether they should be freely available on the internet. And I think this is something we're going to come up against in the future, because social media, professional media, and the availability on the internet instantly is only going to become more and more of an issue or a, a source of data. So these, I'm just going to show a couple of photos we got from the, from the media before we went out. This is taken on the same day as the eruption. This is a kitchen. We know that nine people died in this kitchen. And this is the photo I took a month later, and it's very much similar. You can see that hardly anything's been moved. And from this, we could, we could work out that we were looking at a pristine impact environment, and that was really important. There's a little bit of melting of the bucket here. This washing machine had melted through. But the glasses here aren't cracked, so we can constrain the temperature quite well using these two images. Um, these are images taken at the time of rescue, about two hours after the eruption. And it's in this location to the south of the village. The rescuers came into the south and then filtered through trying to collect people who were still alive. Um, this was useful for us because we could tell a number of things about the, the eruption itself, but also about the impact at the time. So for example, uh, he's walking on the curb here, which tells us that the deposits on the road are still hot. Um, because otherwise he'd be walking in the, in the road. We've got wet deposits here, which tells us there was rain, which ties in very well with eyewitness accounts we have as well. Um, we can see that the, the casualties or the victims themselves have a very, well, thick layer of ash that's adhered to them, and that was consistent across all of the casualties. Um, and, and the level of burns could be established from this as well. Uh, also, we've got fires still raging about two and a half hours after the eruption. And we could correlate this location and look at the deposit and see where these people had been impacted. Um, this is another couple of shots. Um, I thought long and hard about whether to put these photos up, actually. They're photos of fatalities taken from this, from this building here. Um, 
They are freely available on the internet and widely available. If you do a Google search for Brongang, it's one of the first photos that will come up. But they are also very disturbing. Um, I think, personally, I think they're important from a volcanic hazard and risk perception because this is what we're trying to prevent. And just ignoring the human aspect of it is, is not what we should be trying to do, I don't think. Um, from a purely scientific perspective, this is the same house. This is inside. This is outside. We could visit this house. We could recognize exactly where the casualties were, where the victims were. And we could identify a number of things about how humans respond to this type of surge. And we, we derived the process dynamics from things like the softened plant containers here and the geology, and that would tell us a temperature. Okay. Um, and also, the difference in, in the, the state of the bodies is down to a house fire that occurred in this location. So we can, um, we can deduce that the people were killed before the house fire took hold, and also how this house fire took place. There's motorbikes in here, and we think that they promoted the fire, in short. Um, this is just, just one of my final slides. This is something that was circulated wild, widely at the time, first in November, so again, in the middle of the eruption. And it's a photo of a pyroclastic flow bearing down on a little blue van. And Google Translator says, circulating on the internet and BlackBerry Messenger, a picture showing the final seconds of hot clouds uh, that will swallow a car reportedly driven by volunteers. In the photo, it appears a cloud of hot clouds billowed and swallowed all of those in front. The blue vehicle was carrying people who later became victims, and reportedly four volunteers died from crashing in this event from the hot cloud. We spoke to people who had received this text message, and it was very specifically about a village on the flanks of Merapi. People here might recognize, actually, straight away that that's Pinatubo, 1991. That's not the Merapi eruption. But of course, local, the local people didn't know that. So rumors like this spread very, very quickly, and this caused a lot of panic. Um, in the area, and there was actually some self-evacuation from the north of, uh, of Jogjakarta, following rumors like this and others. So just some discussion points that I thought might be interesting to think about. The ethical or the moral difficulties of obtaining specifically social media, professional media data that's really important to scientific analysis, but perhaps maybe there should be some restrictions on taking such graphic images as this, and... Um, distributing them freely on the internet for anyone to see, including the family, and using them, perhaps. Um, I'm interested in what role social media might have in communicating um, the risk, but also evacuation and spreading rumors. Uh, for Merapi, was it a well-managed crisis? Were they lucky? We could apply that to many eruption crises, I think. Uh, the pros... Wind it up. <laughs> the pros and cons of the defensible and transparent risk assessment versus solo expert. This is what happened at Merapi. It was one person making the decisions. And if he gets run over by a boss, who makes the decisions? It wasn't clear. And then I'll just flick through those and leave it. Thank Thanks you very much. <laughs>